Okay, so the first uh, speaker is uh, Chris Ponting, and here's someone else who's uh, changed field. This seems to be the order of the day. Um, he got his BA in physics and an MSc in particle physics, I think, from Oxford and the University of British Columbia. And then he returned to Oxford, completing his doctorate in biophysics in 1991. Uh, he's currently professor of genomics in Oxford and group leader at the MRC Functional Genomics Unit and is affiliated with the Oxford Center for Gene Function and the Departments of Physiology, Anatomy and Genetics in the university. Uh, he contributed to the Human Genome Project and uh, did much of the sequence comparison um, for the mouse, rats, chicken, dog, opossum, platypus, etc. Um, genome project. And he's used comparative genomics to, uh, to contribute directly to understanding of numerous uh, common diseases. So uh, Chris's title today is Genomes, the Book of Life. So eight minutes. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's been a wonderful week, um, and I'm so pleased to have made the long and arduous journey uh, from Oxford uh, to here. <laughs> um, so let me go back. Um, so here on the left is one of the books of life. It presumably is the, the first book of life. Um, and then on the right, uh, this is uh, the human genome, another book of life. I must say the one on the left is far more uh, readable and comprehensible than the one on the right. Um, so what I wanted to do to start off with was uh, to tell Charles Darwin, if he were to be here today, exactly what we have um, ourselves and others have, have found in the books of life um, over the past few years. So here's some uh, vignettes, five things from the books that I thought Charles Darwin would be interested in. So I thought he might be interested in that the, the venom uh, that comes from the, uh, the, the, uh, the spur of the uh, adult male platypus, some of the proteins that are in that spur um, have the same evolutionary origins uh, as the protein uh, genes that are in the venom of snakes. I thought he might be interested in that. Um, uh, despite his, his, uh, his shooting of a platypus in, in uh, Australia, he was interested in platypus. Um, he might uh, be interested in the fact that we found so many uh, genes whose, whose proteins could detect uh, odorants uh, in birds that we found that they have a, a stronger sense of smell than uh, previously uh, thought. Um, we showed that there's a vast variety of uh, different ways that rodents can perceive uh, odorants um, and uh, a very diminished sense of uh, smell in, 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 in great apes. Um, he might be interested that actually the milk protein genes seem to have emanated uh, from uh, tooth genes in the distant past. Um, and he might be overwhelmed by the idea that uh, people are now beginning to sequence fossils. Um, so both Neanderthals and, and mammoths in, in past uh, few years. Lastly, um, here's uh, evidence of the remarkable plasticity of, of genomes. Here are two munt uh, jack deer. Um, and on the far right top is the, uh, the genome of the, the Chinese munt jack. And on the bottom left is the one of the Indian um, muntjac. And you can see, despite the fact that these only have um, diverged in evolutionary terms in a few million years, there has been this remarkable change in how uh, their, their DNA is stitched together in uh, chromosomes, um, almost akin uh, to the cancer genomes that Harold was talking about earlier. Here's something else that he might be interested in, something which is in development and not yet in the field is DNA barcoding of uh, organisms. Um, so that the idea here is that in the field, you could pick up a biological sample and essentially sequence it uh, and to know exactly from which organism has the sample derived. Um, so on the top would be uh, uh, two butterflies. You sequence them, you realize that they're two different species, uh, again, with the, the owls on the bottom. Um, and this has been used uh, to recognize bushmeat um, that has been legally uh, poached. Uh, again, this is something um, that Darwin, who blasted his way across the globe, uh, probably was guilty of too. Um, so, so here is not a slide that I wish you to read. Um, it is very difficult to read, but that's the point. 
the human genome is very difficult uh, to read. What it is uh, are the ACs, Gs, and Ts, 10,000 of them, taken from a random part of human chromosome 13 and colored. It's colored in, in, uh, in a background of black if it is, the chimpanzee has exactly the same letter, A, C, G, and T, in that position. So all the white bits are the differences. So I think Darwin really would be amazed by the fact that we are so um, similar at the genetic level uh, to, uh, to chimpanzees, um, and in fact, many other great apes and mammals. So roughly, you know, two bases or so are different from humans. And if you look at any two humans, then one in a thousand letters are, are different. So 10 of those sites will be different between uh, myself and, and you. Um, now this would be page one of a 300,000 volume. Of, we have two volumes in each one of us, two genomes. Um, so it's rather uh, a difficult book to read. Now when we um, compared the human genome to other genomes, uh, the first surprise really is that only 1% of the human genome makes protein. So what does the rest do? Well, 90% of it, I do believe, is, is junk. It's the evolutionary debris of selfish elements that have um, are procreated within our own genomes. Now, there is another 9% that is functional. We believe it to be functional, but we don't really know what it does. Now, some of that will be the kinds of elements that David Kingsley and David Stern yesterday afternoon were talking about that regulate how genes, um, protein coding genes, work. The next surprise was that our elevated view of ourselves really in terms of the number of genes, protein coding genes in our genome, turned out to be very wrong indeed. We thought at some point that we might have 100,000 genes, but really in today's uh, accounts, we only come down to about 19,000 genes the same, roughly, as the nematode worm. <laughs> but we should remember what Darwin said. Darwin said it's absurd to talk of one animal being higher than another. We shouldn't really think of um, ourselves as being elevated simply in terms of numbers of genes. We need something else to inform us on this question. So here's the tree that we have been uh, looking at all week. And on the right um, is the position of the, the mouse. I've just imposed that there. And on the bottom is the position of Homo sapiens. Now, our common ancestor was something that looked like this. This is a tree shrew, a, mo a modern tree shrew. Looked like that, of course. It wasn't. Um, it's 90 million years ago. But that's our common ancestor. And what we've been doing in, in modern genomics is looking at how the genes that existed in this common ancestor uh, flowed down these different lineages to the mouse and to the human. Um, and so we know that there are about 20,000 uh, mouse genes and, as I've said, 19,000 human genes. Now, you notice the, very, the thousand genes different between the two. So if, if, if gene, protein gene count was the, the uh, mark of complexity, then the mouse would be more complex than ourselves. The thousand genes that are different are essentially those that their mouse have to detect odorants and that we do not. So Charles Darwin realized that there was evolution uh, by descent only, that there was no evidence really for spontaneous um, creation of species. And we think there is no evidence for spontaneous creation of protein coding genes in mammals either. So Darwin said you know, he was not convinced with spontaneous species creation. He must have more evidence, and I agree with him, uh, if we were to talk about genes too. The Nature editorial um, back in 2002 said that 99% of mouse genes have direct counterparts in human. And this um, then provoked a poem from John Updike. Um, we sleek it, Karen, timorous, timorous beastie. Girl science says that at the least the we share for full 99% our genes, where the odd ain went. So, so where did the last, the, the odd one go? Well, these are genes that have died on one of the lineages or the other. And there is such a gene, it's just an example, of a gene that has been lost separately in the mouse and the armadillo and bats and ruminants like cattle. This is very surprising because 
in human individuals, when they lose this gene, become blind. So we don't understand why the mice, when they have lost this gene in the, in the dim distant history, um, are very well able to see. Now, that's protein coding genes, the 19,000 of them in our genome, but there are many more that don't. We've heard about microRNAs. These that I'm considering here are long non-coding RNAs, not micro, but sort of macro. Now these, they do appear to be spontaneously being created along the lineages. They don't come from the common ancestor. They have arisen in the meantime. Now there are, they can come from either side. Um, and there's several thousand of these to add to the 19,000 protein coding genes. And there's little evidence for their conservation between human and mouse. So they do appear to be spontaneously being created. Um, yes. So um, I will simply go through and say that Charles, uh, he was very uh, um, interested, obsessed indeed, by uh, his, his own illness. Um, and he was uh, describing perhaps himself when he talked about a man that carries his own, in his constitution the seeds of an inherited disease. So this is really my last slide. So he was pro provoked uh, by Malthus's essay. Uh, he became really the first population scientist. And this is really where population genomics is going to. Each of our books of life differ for each one of us. Some pages are absent, some are duplicated. And the DNA differences that underlie disease will often be rare, unique perhaps to each one of us. So our challenge in the future will be developing therapies that will be a widespread benefit in response to these rare genomic changes. And I hope that we can read the books of life so well in the future that we can put each and every one uh, genome that's uh, generated on the web so that everyone in the community can read their own genome and have their own journey. Thank you very much. Thank you.